On June 28th, I had the opportunity to guest host a show called Truth Talk Live, and I thought I'd share that with you. It was my thoughts following the presidential debate on CNN with Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Rather than bring a political slant to it, I brought a caregiver slant, so enjoy the program. Welcome to Truth Talk Live. I am Peter Rosenberger. Glad to be here. I'm guest hosting today, uh, this lovely Friday afternoon, and we're going to talk a lot about last night of what happened at the debate, but from a much different perspective. Uh, I host a radio program every week for family caregivers. I've been a caregiver now for four decades, and I have some thoughts on what I observed at the debate last night from a caregiver standpoint. And the world I live in, we have certain things that we see that maybe others don't, and we know about them. And so we're going to talk about that today. And if you want to weigh in on that, then you can call 866-348-7884, 866-34-TRUTH. And we'd love to have that conversation at some point during this today's program. I may step over to the caregiver keyboard that I play. And if you've got something you want to hear, I'll be glad to try to play it for you. I usually stay with the hymns because that's where most people live and know songs like this. But if you've got something you want to hear, I'll be glad to. And we'll talk about that too, because I'm on a mission to help reintroduce hymns uh, to folks to let them know how to anchor their faith, particularly during unsettling times. And wouldn't you agree at this point that we're rather unsettled as a nation? I think when we watched what we saw last night, and I don't know how many of you all watched it, but it's pretty unsettling to see the president of the United States in that manner. And you kind of have to wonder, what do our allies and our adversaries think about that? And what have we come to in this country? So if that's something that's on your mind, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. And just a little bit of background on me, on why I'm going to talk about this and what I do for almost 40 years, for four decades now, I've been a caregiver for my wife, still am. 86 surgeries, both her legs amputated, treatment by more than 100 doctors in 13 hospitals. I stopped counting after 100 doctors. The medical bills have exceeded well over 15. I've just It's just hard to count at this point. 15 million. And I've been doing this since Reagan was president. And I've learned a lot about life, love, faith, suffering, challenges, uh, impairments, all kinds of things. And some years ago, I launched a, a whole focus on the family caregiver, on those who put themselves between a chronically impaired loved one and even worse disaster. And that's what I do. And some of you may have heard my program on this network and um, and certainly on the Truth Network podcast. And I've been doing this for a long time, written several books on it. My newest book is called A Minute for Caregivers When Every Day Feels Like Monday. And these are just one-minute chapters that I write for the family caregiver. Now, a family caregiver is, when I, when I started doing this, people thought, well, you're just talking about nursing homes. No, I'm not. I've, my wife's never been in a nursing home. And and we've been doing this since we were in our 20s. There are families out there with special needs children, Down syndrome, autism, uh, spina bifida, all kinds of things, cerebral palsy. There's all kinds of things out there that don't necessarily take somebody to a nursing home. Then you got mental illness. And certainly we have an aging population. Our bodies are living longer than our brains are. And you have that going on with the baby boomer population and all that kind of stuff as we're getting older. And then you have a a category that nobody's ever really considered until I started doing this, at least not nationally. And that's with those who are impaired with alcohol or drugs. And if you have a loved one who is chronically impaired with an addiction, you are a caregiver. You may not think of yourself as such, but you are. Because it's a chronic illness. It's a chronic impairment. And even if they're walking in recovery, which is great, it's a constant fight to stay in recovery. Any addict will tell you that. There's a great um, thing I just saw recently on Russ Taff. And he is very candid about his journey with addiction. 
and gospel singer Russ Taft. My wife did a, she and Russ did a great duo, and you can hear it if you want to go to our website and see some of our music and so forth. Gracie's an amazing singer, and uh, it's peterrosenberger.com, but Russ and Gracie did a fabulous duet, and he and Tori are just wonderful people. I've had them on my program, and he's very candid about it, and I'd like for you to take a look at this. You can go out and see uh, his stuff. And one, there's a documentary on it called I Still Believe, and, and I would really appreciate going out. And I know Russ, Russ and Tori would, because these are things that we need to talk about as believers, and if we don't talk about it, who's going to? Who's going to offer the hope of the gospel into this? And before I get into the whole thing with the debate, and we'll, we'll carry this over the, over the course of this program, I, I want to introduce you to a concept that I want you to think about as you think about the debate from last night with Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And there's this thing called what I, what I call the fog of caregivers, fear, obligation, and guilt, the fog of caregivers. And every caregiver will get into this fog where we, be, we become so disoriented. We don't really know how to function, and we can get very hurt. Now, what do you do in a fog? I know all of you have driven, and you've been in a fog situation. What's the first thing you do? Well, you slow down. Now, do you turn on your high beams or you turn on your low beams? Well, you turn on your low beams. Why is that? Because if you turn on your high beams, it's going to glare back at you. So when you're driving in a fog, if you're trying to see too far ahead, it's just going to glare back at you. You have to just deal with the light in front of you. And what does Scripture say about that? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Not a searchlight, a lamp. Sometimes we just see the next step. But you have to go slow. And when you are taking care of somebody with any type of chronic impairment, you've got to slow down. You keep That fear, that obligation, that fear will say, well, what, are we, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to do this? How, what's going to happen here? That obligation is going to say, I have to, I'm supposed to, I need to, uh, I should have, you know, I'm, you know, all that kind of stuff where I'm obligated to do it. And then that guilt is going to hit you with all kinds of things such as, uh, I feel guilty because I can stand up and they can't. Or I want to watch a television show for uninterrupted for 30 minutes, that kind of thing. And we feel guilty. We're driven by that. The fog of caregivers. We're going to talk about this more when we come back. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is Truth Talk Live. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Truth Talk Live. This is Peter Rosenberger, guest hosting today. Truth Talk Live, 866-348-7884. If you want to be on the program, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-34-TRUTH. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you all think that Joe Biden demonstrated cognitive impairment last night? Just, just a show of hands. Now, if you think this, then why was he up there? And it seems like the Democrat Party and everybody else is looking at this in just a panic, and they're trying to spin it. And he was out doing a rally today, and he had a teleprompter, and somebody wrote a speech for him, and so forth and so on. I get it. Damage is done. Now the whole world has seen this. Now, I'm not coming at this from a political standpoint. I'm coming at this from a caregiver standpoint. Because how many of you all have seen somebody in your life who has demonstrated cognitive decline? Who doesn't need to be driving? And you're worried about them in the car. You're worried about them when it comes to their checkbook. The awesome power that we have invested in one man in the presidency resides in that man last night. Now, why is he up there? And who is responsible for this? And as a caregiver, I can tell you that my concern and my um, pointed comments are not necessarily for Joe Biden, but for all the people around him who have enabled this. And I talked about it in the last block, the fog of caregivers. The fog of caregivers, fear, obligation, and guilt. 
And this is what gets us disoriented. If we try to race through the fog of caregivers, if we, if we don't slow down, if we don't really back it off, we're going to get just as hurt as if we were driving in a fog and running into a tree or running off of a cliff. And this is where we are as a country right now. We've seen this from, from day one. That's why he ran from the basement in 2020. They didn't want to put him out there. They knew he couldn't do it. And this is not new. But it's amplified now to almost deafening levels. And here we are. Now, who's, it, who's responsible for this? Is Joe, Joe Biden responsible? Well, maybe. But there are lots of people around. But there's one person in particular who has access to him that nobody else does. And that's his wife. An educated woman. Why is she being this way? Why is she allowing this to happen? I saw her leading him off the stage last night. Somebody cr- grabbed that on their phone. And and I saw her leading him off, and she's looking at him and says, You did good. You'd answered you answered every question. That that is the most powerful office really in the world. And that's that's the response. You answered every question. What responsibility does she have in this? Now let me give you a little bit of history here. She's not the first first lady to enable a spouse with something going on. And in fact, we can go back to uh, Edith Wilson. Woodrow Wilson had a stroke, and Edith Wilson was basically de facto president uh, for a very long time. And a lot of people didn't know it. We didn't have the kind of media. Of course, nowadays media, I don't know that you feel this way or not, but our media today has been out there touting that he's just sharp and behind closed doors, you know, he's turning cartwheels and doing trigonometry and everything else. And, And now we see that they've been lying and staffers in the White House and Democrat Party and, and the media and all that, they've all been just basically uh, gaslighting the American people and, and the world. We've all seen it now. It's there. We can't, we can't unsee this. This is not some kind of uh, fake shot that they try to promulgate. So what's going on? And again, you, you can put politics into this all you want, but I'm talking about this from a caregiver standpoint. This is what happens to families when they allow someone to continue past their prime, past their abilities. And there you go back to Edith Wilson, and she did this. Here's what she said. This is a quote from that she wrote in her memoirs. Edith Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's wife, so began my stewardship. I studied every paper sent from the different secretaries or senators and tried to digest and present in tabloid form the things that, despite my vigilance, had to go to the president. I, myself, never made a single decision regarding the disposition of public affairs. The only decision that was mine was that what was important and what was not, and the very important decision of when to present matters to my husband. Well, that sounds like she is saying something very noble, but do you realize what she's saying? She's saying, I decided on what went to the president. Not her husband, her. Not what went to her husband, but to the president. The president of the United States was having everything filtered through his wife, who was not appointed, and she was not elected. And she made that decision. Nobody voted for her. And so she's thinking in herself, she, in her mind, she's doing something right. She's writing this in her memoirs. Oh, look at what I did. But she disregarded the fact that the American people elected Woodrow Wilson, not Edith Wilson. Now, again, there's plenty of first ladies who have enabled spouses, whether it's through cognitive impairment or uh, behavior impairment. And, and you can do your own search on that. You know, but, but it's not limited to the White House. Some years ago, Strom Thurmond, I'm from South Carolina originally, Strom Thurmond was at a, at, a, um, at a reception, and somebody looked over, and he was over there, uh, he had buffalo wings that he was stuffing into his coat pocket, and the sauce was just dripping out of his coat pocket. And aides quickly rushed over there to get him and usher him away. He was, at the time, in his, in his uh, mid-90s, And he was the president and pro temp of the United States Senate and fourth in line to the presidency. And he was being enabled in this. And then you got, uh, you remember this in 2010, Hank Johnson. Uh, He became a punchline. He's a congressman from Georgia who I believe is still sitting in Congress. And he was worried about the overpopulation of the island of Guam, that it was going to tip over and capsize. And 
later on they try to dismiss it. He was just joking. I, 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 I've looked at the tape. He was asking a sincere question. He thought the island was going to tip over. And, and you can just go through representative and elected officials over, over time. There's so many of them, and they get enabled in there. If, take it out of the political. Put it in entertainment. Look at Elvis. Colonel Tom Parker was pushing him out on stage. He needed to be in the hospital. And yet the show had to go on. And and I and I've I've been able to talk with others who did it the right way. I, I I've had um, Glenn Campbell's wife on my show, uh, Kim, and a wonderful wonderful lady. They lived uh, when we lived in Nashville. They just lived down the road from us a little bit. But Glenn, when he had Alzheimer's, he went out on tour. Told everybody he had Alzheimer's, and they did a documentary. It's a, it's worth seeing if you get a chance to. It's called I'll Be Me, and. They, the audience knew he had Alzheimer's. The band knew he had Alzheimer's. Glenn knew he had Alzheimer's. And yet they still did it as a farewell tour to say goodbye. And I'm dealing with this. And I want to bring awareness to this. And it was, it was an amazing tribute to a family that this is how we're going to deal with this. So there, there are people that do it right. And there are people that don't. And we're going to talk about that some more when we come back. 866-34-TRUTH. This is Peter Rosenberger. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Truth Talk Live. This is Peter Rosenberger filling in today, 866-34-TRUTH. If you want to be a part of the program, 866-34-TRUTH. We're going to try to get to our calls here in just a moment, but I want to finish touching on this thing because I'm setting the table of why I'm talking about this. And I'm bringing a family caregiver's point of view, somebody who deals in this world. Because if you have somebody who exhibits these kinds of behaviors, you start asking questions. If those questions become part of the normal conversation, is dad okay? Is mom okay? Is he okay? If that become those those questions are legitimized in the caregiving world. Okay? They are because we're the family's asking. And people are asking. People are starting to say something. And if you keep dismissing it off, then what's happening is you've gone from caregiving to enabling. And that is a very dangerous trap. A lot of caregivers find themselves in this place. Have we gotten there now as a country? Do we have a sycophantic media and the Democrat Party and at the top of the spear, the First Lady, enabling behavior that is not okay? It wouldn't be the first time in this country. It may not be the last time. But as I mentioned earlier, you had a situation with Glenn Campbell where he knew what was going on. His family knew what was going on, and everybody talked about it, and he wanted to go out to the fans and say, I want to bring awareness of this. I want to say goodbye. I want to say thank you, but this is what's happened to me. Bruce Willis's family did the same thing. They pulled him off the movie set. Billy Graham stepped away from the pulpit. I mean, he had one last sermon, but it was you know, he was very op- uh, open about what was going on with him with Parkinson's and everything else. My father. Stepped away from the pulpit. He has Parkinson's. And he stepped away from public ministry in that regards because of the, the challenges that Parkinson's were, were giving him and still are. And so there are people that do this and, and they handle it well, but every family is going to deal with this at some point. If you live long enough, you're going to need a caregiver. If you love somebody, you're going to be one. Okay. So movie stars to presidents to evangelists, everybody's going to deal with this of having to take the keys away. They're going to have to worry about uh, uh, access to cooking devices and bathtubs. Mobile phones will be confiscated. All those kinds of things. And what we saw last night was a, a man who was not able to function in a normal fashion in the hardest job in the world. And we're not the only ones that watched that, by the way. I mean, that, that did get a lot of people to, as viewers. Do you think that they watched this in China? Do you think they watched it in North Korea? Do you think Putin had his people watch or Putin was watching it himself? What do you think? Well, of course they were. So what's going on here? And just as there are a lot of ways uh, to have impairments, there are a lot of ways to be enablers. 
And you'll see people saying things like in the caregiving world, oh, he's just tired. Well, that's just the way he is. Uh, she's got a lot on her, or he's in a lot of pain, or she's just eccentric, or he's always been that way. Those are things that people use to kind of cover up. Last night, we had a new one. Did you hear it? Oh, he's got a cold. Well, I get colds. You get colds. I do radio with colds, and I'll come on and say, hey, I got a cold. You know, and I'll sound, my voice will sound foggy and everything else, and I'll sniffle a little bit. I'll try not to do that into the microphone. But you know I got a cold, and I got a cold as listeners, and, and, and we, we all know, we, we let each other in on it. Yeah, I got a cold. That's why I sound this way. Sorry. You know? Those phrases that we justify this kind of stuff, this is the human condition. There ain't no deception like self-deception. We are prone to deceive others and ourselves without objective and established safeguards. The addiction to power and fame and money is going to blind any of us. We're all susceptible to this. Even propping up someone beyond their capabilities. And that's what we saw. What do we do about it? How do you do this? Millions of people are vulnerable due to his obvious impairment last night. You see that. Everybody sees it. I mean, if you got somebody who is, if, if you have somebody who is driving and they're impaired, whoever's in their path is vulnerable. And if you can't get them to pull over the car, and if they're going the wrong way down the interstate, you have to make a decision at the point, are you going to step out of the car and tuck and roll? Or are you just going to careen right into a ditch or a, Uncoming a semi or something on your own. Are we there yet as a country? You tell me. Because what we saw last night is alarming. It's not just alarming to those who don't particularly support Joe Biden. It's alarming to people who did. If you watch CNN and MSNBC and all these others who are really in the tank for the Democrat Party... If you watch that afterwards, they were in full-blown panic mode. The pressure on Joe Biden is going to intensify. I watched it on social media. I could just see it just going. It's going to intensify because she knows. The wife knows. Okay? The husband, the spouse, the children know when somebody is impaired. They know. Now, the question is, what is she going to do about it? And I saw that video of her helping her husband off the stage let's say go to his hand and say yay you answered every question that is not something you say to the leader of the free world after a debate you fist pound you say you knocked out of the park honey whatever but you know i my wife has come off the stage my wife lives with severe disabilities both legs are gone 80 something surgery she's had a tough go but she comes off the stage after singing I, i have never in my entire life with her said yay you sang every song if she if she blew a chart, I'll say, "Hey, you blew a chart," you know, kind of thing. And she certainly said it to me. You know, what? Where were you? Drop that. You know, that's the normal kind of thing after this. But you don't say, "Yeah, you answered every question." And as she's helping him off those stage, uh, off those steps, how much longer until she steps up and helps him off the world stage? And because this is the place we're in right now, protection of an impaired loved one and everyone that's in their path is the number one task of being a caregiver. That's, the, that's not the number one motivator. That's just the number one task. You have got to protect them and people around them if necessary. Caregiving is heartbreaking. Those of you who are doing it right now, you know that it can be very heartbreaking. But when you're an enabler, it makes it even more painful. And that's what I wanted to introduce into the conversation today. I want to go to Vin and Charlotte. And he wants to chime in on this. Vin, how are you feeling? Yes, sir. How Hi, you Peter. Feeling, how Vin? are you today? Yes, can you hear me? Hi, Peter. I can I can hear you fine. How are you feeling? I always ask everybody who calls me, how are you feeling? I'm fine. I'm fine. And, and I hope you are, too. Oh, I'm just precious. Tell me why you want to chime in on this. Okay, I'm not going to hold you too long. Uh, last night, I, I, I watched um, the highlights of the debate with Biden and Trump. Um, I saw what Nightline put on the air. I missed the actual debate because I was at work, but... To make a long story short, I did see Biden's response and Trump's response on some of the questions, and I was pretty shocked at what I saw as far as how Biden responded and very concerned about his health. Uh, at one point, I thought, I'm like, my God, I hope he didn't fall over and, 
and you know what? I mean, I, uh, I, I felt that there was something mentally wrong with him. I know they said that he had a cold, but I also know that it was 99 degrees this, this Wednesday here in Charlotte. I know it was hot up in D.C. as well, and I didn't see any cold symptoms like coughing, sneezing, or sore throat. He basically, he basically could not uh, uh, answer the questions correctly. Or well, Vin, let me, ask you, let me ask you a question, yes, Vin. What kind of work do you do? Okay, I, I, I do work in IT, and I also work at, I work at a store as well. So, so you work with the people. public? Oh yeah, all the time. Now, have you ever have you ever had to go to work when you've had a cold? Uh, uh, yes, I have, but it wasn't like a a strong cold, maybe a minor, like a sore well, throat or something I mean, like that. It, but, but you still I, had to go to work. To function. <laughs> yeah, yeah I was able to you function, still had to go to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, you yes. did. You have all these brain freezes while you were doing no. your cold. <laughs> yeah, no, see, I mean, that's that's why I'm we, saying this. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. We we know we know what's going on. We've known this for several years. Oh yeah. But but now we all see it. But I, again, I ask, who's really who's in the driver's seat with this? I mean, if the person who's impaired is not willing to to make uh, most people don't want to give up their car keys willingly until they have an accident. True. What kind of accident is the president of the United States going to make? That's a good question, and, here, and here's my thoughts on that. Um, as I told one of my coworkers last night, when they vote, they better take a good look at the, the running mate because that might be who takes in charge. Uh, make a long story short, Biden, if there's a mental issue that could take his life or at least make him not fit to even do anything anymore, uh, it, it could happen at any moment. I mean, this guy could go to sleep. T- tomorrow yeah, well, and not wake up the next day. We don't know. He, I mean, he could indeed. They have. Listen, we're up against a hard break, Vin, and I want you to know I appreciate you chiming in because it gave us an opportunity to get in the show. Yeah, hey, you go to work with a cold. That's not the point. The point is, is this appropriate? And we're going to talk some more of that when we come back. This is Peter Roseberger. Thanks, Vin, for the call. Truth Talk Live. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Truth Talk Live. This is Peter Rosenberger in for Robbie and Stu and the usual suspects. And glad to have you with us. 866-34-TRUTH if you want to be a part of the program. 866-34-TRUTH. That's 348-7884. And I want to just finish up. We'll go back to the phones here in just a moment. Uh, Vin made a great point in the last block where he said, you know, he had to go to work with a cold. And everybody knows, hey, I got a cold today. You know, we've all done that. And so if the man had a cold, he could have come out last night and said, hey, I got a cold. My voice sounds raspy. That's called self-awareness. That's called people not trying to gaslight and say, no, no, there's nothing wrong with me. But you know what? There is something wrong. Now, the question is, what are we going to do about it? And who, who, who is the person that we need to look at as a country? And I've, said, I've maintained this from day one, that it was Dr. Biden, Dr. Jill Biden. And... She is the one that is closest, and sometimes you need to just pull aside and say, it's time to go home. It's time to quit. And you can take the politics out of this. This has nothing to do with this. It has something to do with being a caregiver, a responsible caregiver. And what I'm asking you to look at is some of you are going to be are facing this right now in your family, and virtually every one of us will face this, where it's time to look at somebody we love and say, it's time to turn over the keys. It's time to do this. I'm sorry, I hate it for you, but you're doing the responsible thing. You're putting other people's safety ahead of your own desires. And this is what is required for us as caregivers, to have those kinds of conversation. My father doesn't drive. My mother doesn't drive. It's okay. They're okay. I know they miss it, and I know they'd like it, but they don't. And we've all been there. And uh, right now, Gracie's not driving, but that has nothing to do with it. Because I have hand controls for her, but it's just right now it's just a little easier if I do everything. And she's cool, she's cool. But I, when when the time's right and she's ready, it's all it's all good. But we have the conversation, and the fact that the country is now having to have this conversation should have never happened. The only reason we're having it like this is because finally the whole curtain's been pulled back, and the world now sees what people have been hiding and enabling and gaslighting. And this is a very dangerous place. And if we don't speak with clarity to this issue, 
what are the consequences? If we don't speak with great clarity and authority, what are the consequences? Now, none of us have the ability to go up to the White House, knock on the door and say, hey, y'all, you know, cut it out. But we do have the ability to vote, and we do have the ability to tell other people and introduce this conversation. Everybody's talking about politics right now, and I get that. But to my knowledge, I'm the only one coming at this from a caregiver standpoint. And so now I'm bringing you into that conversation. I'm giving you vocabulary. of These are better questions to ask. If, if people are not comfortable with the politics, everybody gets all mad. You know, I get all that. But my question is, how, how did we get here? Who's responsible? And how do we transition out of this? What's the next action step? And what's the lesson learned? And I will look no further than the First Lady who knows this man and clearly is, you know, I mean, the Babylon Bee's got a thing right now that he comes off the stage and that's a good boy, gives her husband a treat. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. That's the Babylon Bee right now doing this. It's there. It's out there now. We can't undo this. So anyway, that's my two cents worth. And if you want to see more about what I do and, the, and hear more about the fog of caregivers and understand what I, what I bring to the table here, you can go out to my website. It's peterrosenberger.com. That's Rosenberger. That's Irish. No, it's not Irish. R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G-E-R, PeterRosenberger.com. You see the books and so forth. All right, let's go to Jane real quick in Toledo. Jane, good afternoon. Welcome to the program. How are you feeling? Jane, you with me? Give you one more second here, and then we'll go to Charles here. All right, let's go. Let's, let's move on from Jane. We lost Jane somewhere. Charles in Dayton, Ohio. Charles, good afternoon. How are you feeling? Um, okay, a little bit stressed. Um, I've been a caregiver for my wife. Uh, basically before COVID, she had a reaction to flu shot about a year or two before COVID, and she's been staying inside except for when she's had to go to the doctor or the emergency room, something like that. And last June, she's had COPD coming on for a while. Um, she's a smoker. Uh, she went to pulmonologist last June, and... Uh, he detected what he thought was uh, a nodule, and she went to uh, Indianapolis, and they said she had uh, first-stage uh, cancer nodule, and she's had uh, five radiation treatments in, in between there and now, and she's been back to the radiologist, oncologist, All right, well, Charles, and they say that it's doing... Charles, I don't want to I'm cut you off, because, but we're going to run out of time here. What's, what's the immediate issue you're struggling with the, the immediate thing is that uh af, after after all these uh years and all this stress and everything she's got gotten here recently in the last week or so um she has gotten real mad at our daughters for trivial things uh, she doesn't want to see them doesn't want to talk to them um she talked about she doesn't know if she wants to be around me or not she wants to be somewhere by herself um, she's even said th some things about harming herself. Have you talked about this with her doctor? Uh, not, not with uh, any of them. She has okay. very little to do with her doctor. She's got uh, a primary she's seen one time, the pulmonologist a couple times, and then the radiologist and the oncologist a couple times. All right. Well, listen, let me give you a quick thing because I don't want to run out of time and cut this off. Here's, here's the deal. This is not a situation that gets better on its own. But this is also not a situation you may be able to change. But there are medical professionals who can deal with this. And if you think that she is a harm to herself, then you have the responsibilities. Like I said throughout this program, that's the caregiver's task is to protect that impaired loved one and everyone in their path. And so you have that responsibility to make the call to her doctor. And say, look, this is what she is saying. And if she doesn't like you, and if she gets mad at you, and she gets all those kinds of things, that's 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 fine. She can get happy in the same shoes she got mad in. But but your responsibility is to protect her. And if she's looking at harming herself, then what is your responsibility? You got to raise your hand and say something, and you got to call somebody, and you got to call. You start with her primary care doctor's office and say, look, I need to have a conversation here. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. And they can point you to places and resources they may want to see her. They may, they may have. You may have to. 
Look, there may be a situation where law enforcement gets involved. I don't know because I don't know all your circumstances. But I know this. It will not get better if you don't say something, if you just let it just kind of keep going. Now, you were, I think it would be, are your daughters older? They're, they're adults now? Yeah, they're, they're in their uh, 40s yes, and that, 50s. Then, then it would be good good conversation to have with your daughters. Pull them aside and say, hey, look, this is what's going on, um, and it's been recommended to me that I call you know, mom's doctor and have this conversation. And then you could do this, have a group conference. You could have a group conversation about this. Her, her behavior is obviously being noticed by others. But if she's at that point where she's making threats to harm herself, this is not going to resolve itself on its own. So it's time for you to raise your hand and say something. And if you want to bring your daughters involved, get your pastor involved, whatever. But don't just sit there and just blow it off and say, well, she just this is her being hurt. Then then you've stepped into the enabling thing, and then somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. You tracking with me? Okay. Yeah. All right. You got your marching yeah. orders? First, yeah. First call is call your doctors. Maybe then call your pastor, and then get on the horn very quickly with, with her doctor. This okay. thing, don't, don't, don't right. wait. Don't wait on it. Okay? Okay. I appreciate right. the Thank call, you. Charles. I really do. All right. Jane, I think, is back in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, Jane, good afternoon. How are you feeling? Good afternoon. Um, um, we've got, we've got just, just two minutes. So, yeah, um, um, yeah um, the, the curtain is being pulled back on Biden. That's a good thing because, you know, before uh, a problem can be addressed, it has to be identified. And um, so, first for him. He needs the Lord, the country needs the Lord. I'm calling um, just to encourage any caregiver as yourself. Um, and it can be, I have a disability, I don't have support. And I know, uh, you know, different people in nursing homes that it's a very difficult time. So you are much, much, and I know it's a sacrifice, and you may have to sacrifice even more, but it's immeasurable um, what you do when you reach out. And, and you do that because a lot of people fall through the track. And um, so I just want to express that to you and anybody else uh, and, and encourage anybody else to, you know, step up and, you know, reach out to others as well. That means a lot, Jane. It really does. And I thank you so much for the call. I really do appreciate that. You know, Jesus said very clearly that we're going to stand before him and he's going to say, sick, naked, thirsty, hungry, prison, stranger. And he's he's pretty serious about it. Sick, naked, hungry, thirsty, prison, stranger. When did we see you like this, Lord? Well, as much as you do to the least of these, you do unto me. He's pretty serious about it. And uh, and so I think that uh, Jane's words were very timely. And um, there are people out there that, that need to hear the great gospel in the midst of their suffering. And if we don't walk in it boldly and confidently, we don't have to go brashly, just confident, knowing that we can speak with clarity into people's heartache. We can speak with clarity into people's heartache in this political issue, all the unsettledness that's going on. We can do these things because of the power that we have as children of God, who is given. He, he resides in us, and we can do this. But it starts with us raising our hands and say, Lord, send me. Okay? This is Peter Rosenberger, PeterRosenberger.com. I hope you go out and take a look at the site, PeterRosenberger.com. Thanks so much for giving me an hour today here on Truth Talk Live. We'll see you next time.